All right, let's talk about chapter 29.1 to 29.4. We're going to discuss the um, uh, age of the universe, a model of the universe that we currently uh, suspect is real, um, what this beginning of the universe really refers to, and then the cosmic back microwave background, which is the after glow of the Big Bang. Um, so we uh, go back to the um, idea that um, space uh, is can be warped and, and curved and shaped and pushed and pulled by mass and matter. That's Einstein's theory of relativity, which uh, predicts that. And then up, uh, Edwin Hubble, remember what he noticed was that the further away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving away from us, which means that the universe must be um, expanding. Einstein initially, he was not uh, in favor of that interpretation. Um, and then uh, after Hubble, uh, realized that the universe was expanding, Einstein initially thought that, that he wanted the universe to be static. When Hubble showed uh, via the expansion of, or the, the motion of the galaxies, the universe was expanding. Einstein called it the biggest blunder of his life because um, he predicted that. And, you know, he should have just allowed it to exist in his equations as it was predicted um, instead of trying to force his uh, notion of what the universe should be, a static universe. He wanted it to be static and unchanging um, because he thought that's what it was, uh, which was really not based on any evidence. It was just what he thought it should be. Um, anyway, this idea um, that the universe is expanding, um, if you plot the uh, recession velocity versus the distance of the galaxies, it, it the data fits a line, basically. And if you ask how long it takes for this galaxy that's out here to be moving away from us with a velocity of zero. How long did that take? That's called the Hubble time, and that gives us our first estimation of the uh, quote-unquote age of the universe. So um, the Big Bang is the idea here that um, there was no bang. It's really a misnomer, but the idea is that um, the uh, time it takes to uh, get to this expansion is related to the age of the universe. Um, so uh, uh, what it talks about here is that um, the universe has been expanding. We've been looking for um, whether that acceleration or that expansion has been constant or decelerating. Um, what we've noticed is that the universe is actually expanding and then accelerating by measuring type 1a supernovas. So this is showing um, galaxies uh, before and after a supernova goes off. And you see it's not in the bottom pictures, but it's in the top pictures. These are type 1a standard candles. Type 1a supernovas all emit basically the same amount of light because remember they are a um, uh, white dwarf with a uh, companion star and the white dwarf puts um, material onto the white dwarf. Sorry, the red giant here that um, ex uh, uh, expands or whatever. Um, when it gets large enough, its material um, gets pulled by the white dwarf onto it, and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it reaches the Chandrasekhar limit and explodes into smithereens. And when it blows up, it emits roughly the same amount of light, so we use them as standard candles because the dimmer it is, the further away it is. What we found is that the universe is expanding, and so from this idea of the Big Bang, the uh, galaxies today are moving apart faster than... Uh, they were in the past, and we call this dark energy, which is driving this expansion. Basically, the more space there is, the more energy there is, and the more space is created in between the galaxies, and that creation of space is leading to this expansion of the universe that we call dark energy. Um, globular clusters here are some of the oldest things, um, 13 billion years old. Uh, some of the oldest things in our galaxy, some of the oldest things in our universe. So we compare the globular cluster stars in our own galaxy to um, stars at the edge of the uh, universe, the, the furthest, faintest stars we can see. Um, this is a telescope here uh, and showing you comparing to the Colosseum in Rome for some reason, if people know what that is for scale. All right, so model of the universe here. Um, we based on this idea of the Big Bang that, you know, Hubble's just measured galaxies to be moving away from us. And if you just say, well, if they're moving away from us now, then they must have been closer to us in the past. 
and ask how long would it have been since they were right on top of us, then uh, you get the age of the universe at about 14 billion years since the furthest galaxies that we can see would have been um, right on top of us. So this is where this expanding universe comes from, the idea of it. Um, and uh, there's a really interesting thing here. All of our models of the universe are all consistent. Um, and that's, you know, an important part of a scientific theory is to be consistent with all your observations. Um, one of the things we observe is that light from really far away is redshifted. And it's not redshifted just because of the relative motions. We've talked about the Doppler shifts. Um, it's not shifted just uh, because of the relative motions, but it's actually shifted because the wave, as it travels towards us, space has been expanding. And so the wavelength gets longer as it travels through space itself being stretched. So when we look at distant galaxies, there's two redshifts we care about. One is the redshift from its motion, but there's a second redshift um, where the, from the stretching of the waves um, due to the expansion of the universe. So there's different uh, models which tell us about the fate of the universe. When the Big Bang happened, which was again not a Big Bang, it was just a moment in the history of the universe where it was very hot and very dense. Did it expand forever uh, or will it expand and then will, it, will gravity um, pull back on everything and cause the universe to collapse back in on itself? Will it expand forever and never reach? I mean, it will still decelerate, but it will never completely collapse. Will it expand at a constant rate forever? Or is it, which um, it turns out ours appears to be, a universe that will uh, expand and then accelerate and expand even faster. So we're trying to understand which of these universes we live, live in. We're pretty sure we live in the accelerating universe now based on the data. Um, this is a plot that's again showing the different models of the universe as a function of time here. This is the scale and this is time. So this is a universe getting bigger and then smaller. This is a universe that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and then just kind of coasting. And here's one that's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger at a constant rate. And here's our universe accelerating, okay? So it gets, its scale increases as a function of time always and that's what we expect our universe to do. Um, uh, okay, so yeah, the closed universe here is um, the universe that goes, expands, and contracts back down in on itself. Um, we do not expect that to be the case anymore. That was a very compelling idea. Um, what we are pretty sure is that we have an open universe and it will expand forever. Okay, so this cosmic tug of war is just the interplay between gravity slowing the collapse, uh, slowing the acceleration down, and dark energy expanding it out. So that's the two things we care about is how quickly is the universe expanding and how hard, uh, how much matter is there of gravity in terms of the galaxies to slow this down. Um, and what we find is that the uh, um, density is about one to create a nice flat universe, um, which is constantly expanding and accelerating. Um, so it's very, uh, very interesting. Uh, these are um, some galaxies, we're measuring the redshift of them. You can see the redshift here is 8.8, 8.6, 9.5, 11.9. Remember, redshift is the percent of the speed of light these galaxies are moving away from us. So this galaxy is careening away from us at 11% the speed of light. Um, that's a, a pretty, pretty good clip there to have that amount of redshift. Um, it's a little complicated because it's redshift is also because of the expansion of the universe. So. Um, so this beginning of the universe, um, we don't think of the, this is a good history here to read this. We don't think of the beginning of the universe, excuse me, as, uh, we don't think of the big bang as the beginning of the universe. For example, most physicists and astronomers these day, these days imagine the big bang as a moment in the history of the universe. And we haven't really figured out how to get before that, but we're learning, we're learning how to. Um, so the idea is that the universe was just very hot and very dense at one time, and it's been cooling and expanding ever since. So um, there's a history here of the first few minutes of the Big Bang. So the idea is that you have galaxies, galaxies, galaxies. These are all moving away from each other. Well, if you rewind time together, then you imagine these galaxies all on top of each other. And what would that be like? 
the temperatures and densities would be very high, be, be very hot, and so on. So we're trying to imagine where we are today, if we rewind the universe and start forcing everything together, then we get um, very high Excuse me. density protons, um, uh, electrons in a plasma, and then um, before that we have uh, uh, just quarks which make up a proton in a neutron. We got So you remember your traditional atom is a proton and an electron. Um, you might have a neutron in there too. And then protons and neutrons are actually made of little things called quarks. And so you can imagine the proton being made of all these quarks. Well, if you put the temperature high enough, you can strip the electrons off. And so then you only have the protons and neutrons. But if you create the temperature even higher, you can actually strip the quarks out of the protons and the neutrons. And then you just have the sea of quarks. Um, that are not in any form uh, or style, and those are called, uh, that's called a quark gluon plasma. Quark gluon plasma. And gluons are uh, the particle that holds quarks together. Um, we call it the force carrier of the strong force. Okay, um, so uh, the early universe, um, after 10 to the minus two seconds after this period of the Big Bang where the temperatures were infinitely hot and infinitely dense, um, that's what we imagine the beginning of the universe to have been like, um, is this, uh, initially, the, just, you had photons and electrons and positrons all uh, uh, fighting each other and emitting light and um, not settling down into any sort of atomic structure. And then as the universe expanded and cooled, you started to get protons and neutrons to form. And then protons and neutrons started to get together to form hydrogen and helium and heavy hydrogen, which is called deuterium. Um, so one proton is hydrogen. A proton and a neutron is still hydrogen. It's called H2, which is nicknamed deuterium. So uh, because this is an isotope of hydrogen, and an isotope just means it has an extra uh, ni uh, neutron in it. And then, from about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, the electrons were trapped around the proton, and that uh, allowed light to escape, and so that's what leads us to this idea of the Big Bang. Okay, so um, the cosmic background radiation is the light from this point in the universe. So basically, you, this whole chapter is very confusing, right? The whole idea is that the galaxies that we see today are moving away from each other. And if we, we rewind that until the beginning, how long did it take for those galaxies to be on top of each other? And then we imagine what the universe was have been like. It was just this really hot ball of mess. So at that temperature and density, what would matter look like? What would particles behave like? And at that matter and density, you have electrons, you have protons, you have neutrons, that's what we have today. If you rewind this all the way back to create those temperatures and pressures, you have electrons flying around doing what they want. They don't, they're not, it's not cold enough that the electrons are trapped around the neutrons and protons. The neutrons and protons, they're off doing their own thing, but in fact, the neutrons and protons are uh, broken up into little pieces, so you just have the sea of uh, particles, not in any structural form. So no periodic table of ele uh, elements, none of that stuff. You just have the fundamental forces working. And then as it cooled, you formed nuclei, electrons, protons, and so on. And then those nuclei, um, uh, once they once it cooled enough that the electrons were trapped around the neutrons, light which previously was in a sea of fog, escaped. And that light from the beginning point of the universe. Now remember, when you look out into space, the further out into space you look, the further you look back into time. And you can actually look into the point where this occurred. So you can look all the way back to 13.5 billion years ago and see what the universe was like at that point. You can't see any further than that the, the most distant light that we can measure is the cosmic microwave background, and it's the light emitted 
uh, when the Big Bang cooled enough for photons to no longer be trapped in a cloud. It's like the fog lifted. So this is the idea of the Big Bang. Um, as the universe evolved, 300,000 years after the Big Bang, then the photons were able. So when we look back, we're looking further and further and further back into time until that point. That's as far as we can see, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. We cannot see between that point and the Big Bang. We just can't see it. It's too foggy. There's nothing happening there um, that we can measure, and we imagine it to be like clouds. So you, we can look back into that point. We can't look any further um, because of the photons um, being trapped uh, between uh, a bunch of electrons. Okay, this afterglow, cosmic background radiation, was predicted, and until 1964, when it was observed, the idea of a Big Bang was not really uh, credible and, and not widely believed. Um, but the discovery of the Big Bang uh, cosmic background radiation um, was uh, basically um, the uh, uh, smoking gun, you could say, for this idea of the Big Bang. So the Big Bang theory was, okay, well, folks, if you really believe this, there should be this background radiation, and here it is. If you measure the cosmic background radiation, microwave waves using an antenna, it perfectly fits a black body spectrum, which is exactly what you'd expect, um, and uh, that's what it is. The small difference here, which, you know, this is higher temperature, this is lower temperature, this is your most average temperature. These are the energies of the photons. Um, the, the differences there between the highest and lowest temperatures turn out to be the cold spots, the hot spots, hot spots, cold spots. Those different temperatures um, tell you where the galaxies ended up forming. So COBE, the initial satellite that was launched to look at the CMB, couldn't make up those fine details. WMAP started to, and Planck has the highest details so far ever of the, um, of the background radiation so that we can actually pinpoint, oh, galaxies, no galaxies, galaxies, no galaxies, no galaxies, galaxies. So these slightly higher temperature regions of the uh, universe, the early universe, eventually led to the formation of galaxies, which is kind of amazing. Okay, then based on this cosmic background radiation, we can determine whether the universe is flat or some other shape. Now, what does this mean? Okay, we've talked about how space is um, uh, flat, but if you put in um, a, a mass like the sun, then it curves space, and this curvature of space is what gives you gravity, um, and it's what causes light to bend when it gets near an, a gravitational object. Okay, so the question is then, we've got a star, we've got another star, we've got these warpings of space around that star, and around this star, everything's warped and messed up. But what about in between the stars? Is space overall have a slight curvature, or is it perfectly flat between the stars? That's a big question. If it's not true, if it has some slight curvature to it, then that means eventually it would come back around on itself, which is kind of a weird concept. So whether it's a spherical universe or a hyperbolic universe, um, either of these things would um, lead to some weird things going on. So, so far, according to the cosmic background radiation, we live in a flat universe, and this was uh, an example. This is what uh, we'd expect for a flat universe, and it's largely what we see, as you can see up here. This is the type of pattern we would expect if the universe uh, between the stars had an overall cur you know, positive curvature or our overall negative curvature. So they just don't match the observable universe we see. We're pretty sure the universe is flat. Uh, so to summarize, we think of the universe as having a beginning, quote unquote, 13.799 billion years ago. Um, the Hubble constant is this, which tells the expansion of the universe. Um, the fraction of the universe that is uh, uh, the content of dark energy, which flattens the universe out, is 68%. The matter that we have, whether dark matter or regular matter, makes up 30% of the density of the universe. Those two values are not enough to um, uh, prevent the universe from uh, continuing to expand forever, so we expect our universe will expand uh, forever. Okay, and then I'll talk about 29.5 in the next video. Bye.